laboratory where actually I learned about devices and my interest was uh, after that to uh, use uh, my uh, background in physics to see if I can, we can make uh, new devices and, and, and I was very interested in exploring devices is the reason why, um, you know, uh, this chairman uh, told you that uh, my interest was of course trying to find if the uh, quantum properties of matter can be exploited so I just investigate quantum wide quantum dot and things like this. But, recent, but more recently, um, as I mentioned uh, in, in the panel session yesterday, I think that the future now uh, is, is certainly in terms of uh, functionality is trying to merge, merge our knowledge that we acquire uh, with the development of silicon technology and the power that it generates in terms of information with biology. Why? Because biology are complex system, okay, and they carry a lot of information, they process information a different way that they process information in, uh, with silicon technology, which is very simple. It's just, as I mentioned, the transistor is just a switch, but uh, biology is more complex and give us life and, and intelligence and all of this. So um, I decided to entitle my talk with uh, the 2D nanoelectronics material for biosensing, and uh, I added from physics to machine learning, because this conference is about information processing and machine learning and things like this. But you will see that at the end of my talk, I will use, in fact, machine learning to see uh, if we can, in fact, understand um, what we see uh, by detecting uh, biomolecules. So, uh, here is, in fact, oh, before that, uh, I forget to mention my collaborator here. So, this is actually the work of a team, a both team that actually involve physics from uh, people from physics, um, like my colleague, uh, Professor Schult uh, Klaus Schulten, um, and um, you know, one of my students, uh, Shatanya Sadeh, okay, who both actually unfortunately passed away. Uh, Professor Schulten four, four years ago, uh, Shatanya actually last year. Uh, and so I would like to dedicate this talk to them here. Uh, the other people uh, are, as I mentioned, from physics, electrical engineering, uh, but in, uh, also bioengineering. And uh, my colleague, La Varshna at UIUC, is actually an expert in uh, signal processing, and so I borrowed from his knowledge uh, to um, actually to, um, um, to, 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 uh, to learn about machine learning. So, okay, uh, this, for those of you who don't understand, who have some background in, in, in biology. Uh, this is actually a schematic of a DNA molecule. As you can recognize, uh, this is uh, uh, the double helix, which is called the backbone, okay? Um, so, and so, DNA molecule carry bases, okay? Oh, here. So, bases, and there are four kinds of bases that we call uh, A for adenine, uh, T for tamine, uh, G for ganine and uh, C for cytosine. Okay, so uh, this is this four molecule which are complex, which are actually sitting on the, the backbone of the DNA. Only four. Okay, and so in this four, they form actually a base pair. A is always taught to T, and C is always taught uh, uh, linked to to G here. And this is section. This is a sequence of these bases. Actually, is proper to each individual. Okay, this is actually determine your genetic code. Each of us has actually a different kind of sequence of DNA which we inherited from a parent, things like that. Okay, and so a DNA molecule is actually of the over three billion base, uh, uh, base pair long, like that. So we can see that the combination that you can get is extremely huge. Okay, and so um, the whole problem with genomic Okay, which is the same, is actually to recognize for each of us, you know, this sequence, which carry all genetic information, which actually predict, you know, um, uh, all of you health problem, okay, and things like this, uh, but this actually taking a lot of money. So now I just want to mention that, in fact, the succession of base pair G and C here, so you can see that, um, it, uh, that C and G are in fact bound by three hydrogen bonds, where A and T by two. So actually, the CG 
way the molecule are bound together is stronger for uh, between the gamma and the cytosine here compared to AAT. Okay, this can be very important. Okay, so as I went mentioning, uh, so one of the main issue uh, from the beginning of the century and, and for what uh, will continue is actually to be able to uh, sequence the set of base pair. But the DNA molecule is not straight. It's actually actually uh, uh, just curved around itself and wind it. Okay, so this is actually, you see this DNA, they actually wind along beads here and then finally form a chromosome. And so at the beginning of the century, it was extremely difficult, it's still extremely difficult actually to sequence this. Okay, it takes big labs to do it uh, and it costs a lot of money. We have been able to make a lot of progress to lowering the cost. Okay, you can see here to about uh, this year about thousand dollars to do it, but still require this, they, you know, lots of, uh, as I say, big labs. So the big uh, challenge is actually to be able to see if we can, uh, in fact, uh, do this personal. You know, so if there was, it would be a way that actually we don't require it lab, so that actually we could have a kit. Okay, also what that we actually use to, in fact, do this, this sequencing and lower the cost to a lot of about $100 per sequencing. Okay, so what you can see here, there was, there was a lot of, especially here, about 2010, where we can make a bit able to drop the cost, but uh, here now we are just saturated. Okay, so um, one idea to mine, okay, is in fact to see if we can actually sequence the DNA the way nature does it, but with, um, you know, what we call nanopore. So what the principle of nanopore sensing, okay, is in fact you have here an electrolytic cell with a membrane and a small hole that we call the pore. And so electrolytic cell is in fact uh, a solution um, with some salt. Okay, and we put two electrodes right here. And so you in fact apply a potential difference. And then because there was a potential difference and uh, the salt is uh, ionized, so we have uh, ion like potassium, for example, and chlorine. So they are dissociated. Okay, some are positive, negative, and so you have a current flowing through the, the port here. This is an ionic current. Okay, now, if now you put some DNA, okay, in the upper cell, right, so the DNA is also charged. Each of the bases that I uh, was showing previously carry a fraction of an electron charge, but this is usually negatively charged. Okay. By the way, Professor Allen mentioned to you that desalization. Okay. So it appeared that salt is very important for life. Okay. Why is that? Well, because as you, as okay, I mentioned here, right. So you can see that. You know, if this, this actually um, bases are negatively charged, you have actual negative charge on this side, negative charge on this side, both of them, on the two backbone, right? So they tend to repel each other, all right? And you have billions of them, right? So how do you maintain this together? It's not only because of the backbone, it's because the DNA is actually in a salting water. And so, salted water. And uh, why is that? Because, you know, with salted water, okay, you have positive ions which actually come, are attracted by this um, negative basis and actually maintain actually the binding between the, uh, this, this molecule. So, life not only needs water, but it needs salted water because you need actually the positive ion to keep uh, this. Uh, this actually molecule together. Okay, we realized this. We did some simulation uh, in the past, and then, as I mentioned, I will mention later on uh, molecular dynamics, and we see that we, we start to actually uh, lower the some concentration of salt in which the DNA is basking. Okay, it starts to dissociate. Okay, so it's very important that we have salt for life. Okay, and so uh, I just want to come back to this. Right? So it's negatively charged, and so if you apply a potential difference, and so some of the DNA will go to, in fact, the nanopore here. Okay? And when they go to the nanopore here, they will block the ionic current. And so, so if here you have, in fact, 
a scheme of the, the current, which is in fact uh, of the ionic current <coughs> here, when you don't have DNA in the solution, right, you see actually a flat line, okay? When once you see, you put some DNA molecule inside, you see spikes. What does it mean? The spike, the loss It's actually the current is blocked. And this is actually a first detector that can actually tell you uh, if uh, DNA is present and when DNA is passing to uh, the pore. And this is a very simple principle, actually. The DNA is a bulky body, goes through the pore, block, in fact, the other item. Okay, now, from the shape <coughs> of this current, of the broken current, you can induce certain things. First of all, uh, the width is telling you uh, how long the DNA will stay in the pore, okay? And, you know, um, and the, the depths here can uh, tell you how, how efficient it is in, in, blocking, in blocking the current. Okay, so, uh, and then the, the separation between two of the spikes here uh, will actually tell, tell you more or less the concentration of DNA in uh, the upper cell here. Okay, now, um, now, so there was another way now that actually we have put forward to, in fact, detect DNA. is actually to use this membrane here, okay, which is usually, previously was passive, um, as an electrical, you know, conductor, okay? And so you would have, as I, would, as I mentioned here, you know, we can even detect DNA if, uh, you know, this, this membrane carries a sheet current and so every time that the DNA, which is negatively charged, okay, pass through the pore, it will actually introduce some uh, current variation that actually you can actually also uh, use to uh, see if uh, you know uh, uh, if if the DNA is there or not. Okay. Now, uh, so uh, so. First, people started to use biological membrane with little pore, but uh, soon it became actually interesting to look at the fact that using membrane with solid state. Why solid state? Well, because solid state is robust, okay? Um, and uh, so um, uh, it, it is robust, and so uh, unlike biological nanopore, which, act which actually are sensitive to temperature, mechanical stress and so on. Um, and so they also have some functionality, as I mentioned, because you can act now may make the membrane, the very thin layer, you know, electrically active. And instead of using, in fact, the blocking current by the, the DNA uh, to measure its presence in the pore, uh, we can, in fact, uh, use also the other way to, to see if, uh, with the current along with the membrane, uh, you know, we can also detect uh, the presence of DNA. But there was more, okay? And this is represented here. Okay, when we were treading DNA through the pore here, okay, the idea that was that, okay, each base which is attached uh, to the, the, the backbone, okay, will block the current with a certain amplitude, okay, magnitude. And so this would be a way to recognize the bases. And this is actually represented on the schematic here. You see that? Okay, so you would have, for example, for when a base is exactly in the bottom, like here of the nanopore, uh, you would actually have a blocking current which is more or less larger, but if this is actually a cytosine molecule, it would be less and so like this. So actually by treading the DNA through uh, the pore, you would actually have this different kind of uh, uh, step size uh, diagram which would be able to recognize DNA. So I show this cartoon here because, um, you know, this was different kind of uh, uh, scenario that have been put forward to see what uh, the way we could do it. The, one of the first scenario here was proposed at um, Harvard in a collaboration with UACSD where they would actually have a metallic membrane here and the idea would be, in fact, to use the DNA as a bridge between the two sides of the membrane so that the current tunneling uh, to each of these bases will have a particular signature. But, okay, so um, this is a scenario. We actually propose another scenario to using, uh, in fact, the membrane as a MOS capacitor 
that would use, we would be able to measure the charge of each bit because the base has a specific charge and we could recognize it. Okay, this is actually the result of a simulation that we performed. Uh, but I would have to say that so far, so far, uh, uh, the sequencing, okay, the DNA sequencing, uh, you know, that means the recognition of the sequence of base along uh, the DNA, uh, uh, has not been very successful. Uh, only one company, Oxford Nanopore Technology, okay, has invested a lot of money, and were able, in fact, to provide some sequencing of <coughs> this uh, particular uh, kind of uh, DNA but with biological core and based on the technique that we call the blocking current, right? So, but you can actually, we realize that you can do more than sequencing, which is a very important problem that will be addressed, of course, in the course, in, in, in the term of the, uh, in, in the course of the uh, uh, century. Um, you can, in fact, now use it, also nanopore, for epigenetic detection. What is epigenetic, okay? Epigenetic is, in fact, the discipline that looks at the way the genome is changed, not by changing uh, the base sequence, okay, but uh, some uh, other effect on the backbone, which is called methylation. Methylation, what is a methylation? Is a molecule CH3, okay, and so it attached to the DNA, okay, as it's shown here, at the site of a cytosine. Okay, and you can have actually different kind of methylation, okay, can, as I will mention, hypo and hypometylation, but it is important uh, for medicine what uh, actually determine when, when a gene is turned on and off, but also if you have, in fact, too many of this methylation, this occur all the time in your body, okay, it is actually a cause for cancer. Now, uh, now, uh, so, that, so, the detecting the amount of this uh, methylation uh, along the DNA chain is, is of course important for, for medicine. Uh, okay, and so uh, so we can actually see that now uh, because the the metal is in fact a bigger body. We can actually see if we can use it also. If we can actually see use a nanopore to see if we can detect it. Okay. Uh, so this is also an issue. Now, other things that happen uh, along the DNA is actually a breakage like this. Okay, so the DNA chain, one of the backbone breaks. Okay, this happened all the time in your body. Okay, as you see here, so human cells, so this actually DNA, yeah, human cell. Um, this actually, you have some of the order of 70,000 of this uh, lesion that happened. Uh, you know, uh, you know, every day, but they are sometimes they are repaired, and but you know if they persist, then uh, you actually can generate tumor. Okay, now this uh, nanopore to detect uh, this kind of uh, uh, lesion here, where before what was done was all of this was done by uh, physic, uh, uh, bio, uh, yeah, biochemistry. Okay, now. Uh, I introduced this another pore, and I saw that, you know, using the solicine, I, I mentioned that so using the solicine nanopore to detect all of this uh, bio, uh, biogenomic effect uh, could be interesting. But actually, we can, in fact, see, now use uh, DNA, right, to store data, okay? And so this is actually a way to look at if, in fact, uh, you know, we can use uh, biology uh, to, um, uh, you know, to process information in one way, because this is a chain which is so long and we carry so many of these bases, okay, uh, or we can in fact store information. People have done this, okay, and, but they have not done this by the base, but by the breakage that I mentioned. They, along a chain, they put some breaks, okay, and this actually stores information. And then, uh, so uh, then you can, if you in fact use a nanopore, you can, you know, you can use a nanopore to detect. <coughs> so, what we have here, in fact, is a confluence between um, uh, what I would call nanoelectronics, because uh, we would use transistor made of, you know, material, okay, uh, to store information, right? 
in conjunction with, in fact, the way to process the DNA. And so that way we can, in fact, see if we can process big data, okay, as well as if we can actually uh, uh, solve some uh, genomic or epigenomic uh, problem. Now, how are we going to do this? And we're talking about 2D materials, okay. One of the materials that emerged uh, in the uh, decade after the turn of the century was graphene, okay. So for those of familiar, graphene is what we call a two-dimensional material. And what is a two-dimensional material? This is actually essentially a monoatomic chain of atom, carbon, okay, which we show here. Okay, how do we obtain it? We obtain it from graphite sim by a simple method, which is exfoliation. So okay, graph graphite is made, this is actually the carbon which is in the pencil. You put a scotch tape on the top of you know, the pencil and you remove it. So it's very simple. And then you obtain this monoatomic uh, layer of carbon. Now, this is very important because if we use membrane like from silicon, for example, or silicon nitride, silicon dioxide, we can make them thin, but not as thin as we want, okay? So, so, so usually, uh, you can make very, with solid silicon technology, solid state membrane, you can actually make membrane of the order of, uh, I would say, um, one nanometer, ten angstrom, a little bit low. And so when the, this schematic of the DNA goes through here, okay, you can see that it encompasses of the order of three to four base pair. Yeah, I forgot to mention that the separation between <coughs> two base pair, two successive base pair in the DNA is of the order of 3.4 angstrom. Okay, so uh, graphene is thinner. Okay, it is actually the thickness of graphene because this is a monoatomic layer is in fact three angstroms. So you can actually single out each of the particular base that goes through the pore here and be able to read them. So graphene has been put forward as a material of choice to see if we can identify this DNA and the sequence of information that it carried in DNA. Okay, uh, but there was problem with graphene that I will mention. Uh, later in the next few graphs, okay, there was other material that have emerged too, two-dimensional material, which are called transition metal dichalcogenide, and a good example of here is actually molybdenum disulfide, okay? So here is actually one of the sheets of the material. They are a little bit thicker, okay? You can see here, this is a representation. We have the molybdenum, uh, which is a metal, in the middle, and the uh, yellow balls here. That's a little bit thicker, okay, but it is in fact a semiconductor, right, because this is a band structure, it has in fact a, a band gap of the order of, uh, here this is one point, I think it's 1.9 EV, of band gap conduction band valence band. So it's a material which is electrically active, okay. We can make transistor, one of the first transistor has been made about something like 10 years ago by Andreas Fisch at APFL. Okay, where well, I showed, uh, okay, this is actually a sheet of molybdenum disulfide, so it's doing things like this. We will actually to, to, to show the operation of this transistor. Now, so this actually to tell you that there are 2D material, very thin, okay, uh, in nature that we can use, in fact, to detect, to sense, you know, the structure of the DNA. Now, um, there are uh, some difference between MOS and graphene. Graphene is thinner, okay, but it's hydrophobic. What does it mean hydrophobic? It doesn't like water. Okay, so when you can see actually something which is very close to him, it tends to attract the body, okay, to exclude the water. That means that for DNA, it's sticking, okay? So the DNA goes to graphene, and I will come back on this later, it sticks to it, okay? So it doesn't go very easily uh, to the, um, uh, to uh, the, the pore. Now, MOS2 is actually elastic, okay? So it actually, here is actually, the time it takes for a molecule of MOS2 to, to stick uh, to, a, a, the time it takes for graphene to stick to MOS2, okay? And you can see it's much longer than graphene, graphene is sticking uh, immediately. This is actually a result of uh, molecular dynamic simulation of a particular kind of DNA molecule on each of this uh, layer. Now, I've talked to you about uh, these two materials. Now, what we did some times ago, 
okay, is uh, by considering that uh, solid state nanopore uh, can in fact be used for sequence DNA is to get one step further. Okay, I told you this is electrically active, and that what we propose is in fact to make a membrane act as a transistor. Okay, so uh, what we would get is actually this 2D material here, which is sandwiched between two dielectrics, <coughs> and then putting in fact at some point below it a metallic uh, sheet of layer, which we use as an electric gate. Okay, to control. Uh, uh, by this so that in fact we force the current to go uh, along uh, the core to have better, de better, better detection. Okay, so that's actually a cross-section of the transistor that we propose. We call actually this uh, point to point on contact uh, 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 nanopore field effect transistor here uh, that uh, you know, we have the, the gate here, the silicon well, what kind of dielectric, this is a membrane here, and we would thread the DNA through it, okay, and when you put the uh, uh, DNA to it. Now, why is this important? Because if we can achieve this kind of technology and thread all DNA to it, and we would be able to read actually the information on each of this transistor, uh, the information of the DNA on each of this transistor. Okay, now uh, we haven't achieved this, but we are collaborating now with the group of Professor uh, Alexandra Radel, which uh, are detected electronically now, not only ionically, okay, uh, uh, the dip here detect, in fact, uh, the DNA, okay, uh, but this is actually for a certain kind of salt concentration here, she had one molar calcium, uh, potassium chloride in the material, and as uh, you can see here, uh, we have a lot of noise, but if we can reduce the concentration of the salt, you actually have a good correlation between uh, the, uh, the membrane here is in fact uh, <coughs> the electrical engineering part. Okay, so we had to merge the code, and this actually is a very intensive kind of uh, uh, simulation process which requires uh, very expensive computer resources. In fact. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about the molecular dynamic if you don't know about it. So, what we take is the molecular dynamic consider in fact. A DNA molecule, you have actually to build this DNA molecule, and uh, the system here, which is a membrane with a pore, okay, this is one thing, and then we emerge everything into water, so you can see each of this red and white spot here are actually molecule of water, all right, all of them, okay, so we take account all of them, and then we have to put the ion, depending upon the concentration, you have to put the ion. And then you start the system. When you have all this together, you start the system. There was nothing uh, in terms uh, complicated about it. This is purely application of Newton's law, okay? Because all of this is in fact um, determined by uh, the force exerted between, uh, you know, the the, the 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 molecule itself and the DNA. Okay. So that's uh, the code, code like this is actually kind of expens uh, expensive to run. All right, uh, so, and we have to couple to them uh, the detection of, the electronic detection of the process, wherefore, for example, and I'm not going to go into the detail for this, uh, uh, we use here, uh, you know, uh, non equilibrium ring function technique to measure the current along uh, the ribbon, the graphene uh, ribbon, okay, uh, when we have, uh, MOS2, we use an appro another approach based on Boltzmann transport uh, to, 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 to look at the detection. Now, uh, so if I take back uh, this scheme of the uh, gate, gated membrane, okay, so uh, you see here, this is a simulation that shows, in fact, the concentration of uh, electron and hole in the membrane, this is a potential uh, along the core, uh, electrical potential along the pore, and uh, so uh, this is a voltage applied uh, to uh, the gate into the, the device. Okay, where you have here, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, this is for electrons and this is for holes, and this, this is done for graphene. Okay, when you have a negative bias applied to the gate, we depleted the graphene layer from the electron, but we actually populated it with hole. Okay, uh, so and inversely. Okay, so now uh, what we did uh, in our simulation 
is in fact take a DNA molecule uh, which is rigidly passed through a graphene nanopore here. You can see the dots here are in fact uh, the ion of the salt, uh, the green are potassium, uh, the orange here are uh, uh, chlorine. Okay, uh, and so this is actually, when it goes, because of the electrochemical nature of the DNA, when it goes through the pore, at the pore rim here, this is actually a picture, a simulation picture of uh, the potential, and you can see that uh, it actually rotates. You know, it is actually horizontal here, this slanted here, this is vertical, and then the rotation, and so on, and so on, so. But this is rigidly going through, and uh, so we were interested in finding out if, in fact, going through a pore, which was a narrow pore of the order of 2.5 nanometer diameter, we can actually see the electrical signal, and this was relatively encouraging, this is actually four panel, that the difference between this panel is in fact the position of the pore along uh, the uh, membrane, okay, but uh, e along each part and the size of the pore, along each panel you have in fact four traces, and this four trace depend upon particular gate voltage applied to the gate, okay, uh, so that, but uh, to see if in fact we can modulate the electrical conductivity of the system, and in fact we can, we can actually see that uh, the variation is of the order of one uh, uh, micro, actually here this is one micro Siemens, uh, which, is, uh, which is in fact detectable, and there was some kind of variation as a function of the gate voltage, but what is interesting is you can see here that the signal is periodic because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if the DNA is rigidly going through um, the system, it actually generates an electric uh, potential. Now, uh, just want to mention that uh, if we have a single strand of DNA, what is a single strand? It is it's only one part of the backbone going through uh, the nanopore here. Uh, we could put some analysis of the, the shape of the pore and you know the position of the pore in the membrane to find out if we can in fact detect uh, detect. Uh, each of the bases, okay? So this is actually the experimental setup which is done by another group in the U.S. Uh, at the uh, U of Pennsylvania. Now, I, so I was telling you that recognizing each of this se sequence of uh, <coughs> each of this sequence of uh, base here uh, has not been able to be uh, has not been able to be achieved experimentally. Um, but uh, so uh, progress are still uh, going on. But one of the things that I mentioned also is the methylation. Methylation, uh, so with methylation, uh, we can in fact try to detect if we have methylation along the DNA chain. This actually would produce some uh, important benefit for nanomedicine. Uh, the, the, another way to emphasize this uh, to, uh, is actually to attach a protein to the metal group. This is actually a bigger object. In this respect, we don't have actually to have such a big pore, which is experimentally more achievable. And so we tried it too and see if we can, in fact, detect this methylation. Uh, and so we have done a study uh, by molecular dynamic. You can see here, this is a metal group, the schematic over the double helix here with a metal group. And you can see that this methylation can be detected. The uh, blue curve here shows there was, in fact, by the ionic current, there was a dip, okay, which is, uh, in addition to the dip of the DNA, there's going to be another dip of, uh, that I'm going to show because of the presence of the metal group, which is going to block the current too. And this dip corresponds here to the number of atoms into uh, the, uh, the nanopore, which is actually a good, actually, uh, a good agreement. Uh, this, in, this here, here is actually uh, the signature of the electronic current. You can see that this is a signature of electronic current, this is a signature of ionic current. You can see it's much sharper here, so they actually have better resolution in the, uh, uh, in the electronic current. Now, one of the important issues is now if you have two of this metal group close together, are we able to detect them? Uh, so, simulations show that. If you use the ionic current, okay, you can see here in the red 
This is the number of atoms in the pore. And so every time we have a metal group with a protein going through the pore, we have actually an increase in the number of atoms in the, in the pore, of course. Okay, however, the ionic current cannot distinguish between the two, have a broad, in fact, dip in the current. But if we use, in fact, electronic detection, so the current along the membrane, okay, we can clearly see the two sharp peaks here. So up, up to a point where the separation between uh, the two uh, metal uh, group here is uh, of the order of, uh, uh, five nano, uh, of the order of five nanometer. Okay, so, so actually the electronic detection along the membrane show, seems to add more uh, resolution in the metallation process. Okay, uh, this is actually a movie that shows uh, the, the same process with, this was with graphene with MOS2, uh, where uh, this is a trace of the ionic current, which is a growth this is, in fact, a broad, as you can see here, a broad dip when, you know, we have two metal groups going to the uh, nanopore, but the electronic detection is, in fact, uh, much more efficient. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the issues that, in terms of metallation, that can arise is what kind of protein do you have attached here? We can we know that we have protein, but is there a way we can actually detect the kind of protein? Okay, so um, and for this we have actually taken three kind of protein. One protein we call MBD1, one type of protein. Another protein which is uh, MECP2, and then a protein here which is uh, GCD, is gamma cyclohexane. One pro these two here are associated with, a pro uh, with actually a process which is called hypermetallation. That means that we have a lot of this metallation on the DNA. That means that if you have a lot, it's very bad. You can have cancer. Okay? The gamma cycle, this thing, in other process. This is hypermetallation. There was just a few. This is also not good. Right? Nature is also, you always have a balance uh, between uh, what is good and bad. And, and so, uh, in this process here, there's too few. Is this a way that we can recognize between these two? And this is where, in fact, uh, we can uh, do machine learning. Is machine learning able to recognize uh, uh, these processes? Okay. So how do we do machine learning here? This is a very simple algorithm. We actually take, uh, we make a library of any kind of protein that can be attached to the DNA, okay? And we train them rigidly to the nanopore, all right? And we keep, it. and then when we have a particular kind of event like this one here, okay, we, that is metallated with, we don't know here, what we do is actually, we in fact convolute each of the sig so signal which each of this, um, uh, um, uh, object of the library here. And then we see if there was a fit. And so we did this for uh, the classification of biomagnetic graphene. <coughs> okay. So we take this is actually uh, an unknown signal in uh, 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 with for a uh, MECP2 protein. Okay. And uh, this, uh, sorry, this is, yeah. And this is the reference signal for the three of them. And we can see that. Uh, this is actually the reference signal for MBD1. Okay, when we convolute here, we have actually a negative. We have a dip here, uh, which is actually uh, indicate that actually this is not. This excludes actually this kind of protein. But when we have actually a very positive correlation here, we can simply identify the fact that actually we are dealing with, we can detect this in, uh, we have an MECP2 protein. And we can do this for, uh, now another one, uh, which is here, um, uh, gamma cyclodestrin, and you can see again there was a positive correlation uh, between uh, the uh, unknown signal and the reference signal that we have stored in the library. We can do this also with MOS2 material, okay? Again, here for the detection of MBD2, MBD2, 
okay, we have actually a positive signal uh, for MBD2 and also uh, and also for which one is this? Uh, let's see, MBD1. Okay. Now, what about this? Okay, I would say this is important for a bio. And okay, I can see that I'm just. Uh, uh, my time is going to be up in a few minutes. Okay, so what about the breakage here, what we call nick in the DNA, which is important not only for biomedicine, but can be used also for um, storing information. Okay, one of my colleagues actually in the signal processing group is, uh, is using uh, this kind of uh, a process to store big data on the DNA chain, okay? So, uh, right, and so here is actually uh, the simulation of one of this DNA with a nick here into graphene. Okay, this result of molecular dynamics where we show only the sheet, the graphene sheet, and the DNA, and we have removed all the water molecule and the ion. Okay, that's actually the potential generated. Okay, you can see that uh, here this is a center of mass of the DNA. There was actually a slowdown of the center of mass here. And here we plot the van der Waals energies and with the attraction energy between um, the between between uh, the DNA and the graphene, and you can see that the dip corresponds really when the nick is actually sitting in the uh, uh, in the nanopore. Okay, and uh, so comparison between the ionic current that means is the nick the breakage able to block the current more efficiently than the DNA itself? Actually, it doesn't, okay? Where, in fact, electronically, we can actually recognize it with a long, long, dip, uh, long dip here in uh, the electronic current, okay? We can actually do this, I'm sorry. Um, this is actually, for the nick between the two different kind of bases, this is actually a nick between T and T base, a nick between C and C base, a nick between A and A bases. Okay, and each of them actually show, in fact, the detection by electronically, but not ionically. Okay, uh, now the last figure, okay, is, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is the reference signal for the three of them. And we can see that uh, this is actually the reference signal for MBD1. Okay, when we convolute here, we have actually a negative. We have a dip here, uh, which is actually an indicate that actually this is not. This is excluded actually this kind of protein. But when we have actually a very positive correlation here, we can simply identify the fact that actually we are dealing with, we can detect this in, uh, we have an MECP2 protein. And we can do this for, uh, now another one, uh, which is here, um, uh, Gamma cyclodestrin, and you can see again there was a positive correlation uh, between uh, the uh, unknown signal and the reference signal that we have stored in the library. We can do this also with MOS2 material, okay? Again, here for the detection of MBD2, MBD, uh, MBD, uh, MBD2, okay? We have actually a positive signal uh, for MBD2 and also. Uh, uh, and also for, which one is this? Uh, let's see, MBD1, okay? Now, what about this, okay? I would say this is important for a bio, and okay, I can see that I'm just, uh, uh, my time is going to be up in a few minutes. Okay, so what about the breakage here, what we call nick in the DNA, which is important not only for biomedicine, but can be used also for um, storing information. Okay, one of my colleagues actually in the signal processing group is, uh, is using uh, this kind of uh, a process to store big data on the DNA chain, okay? So, uh, right, and so here is actually uh, the simulation of one of this DNA with a nick here into graphene, okay? This result of molecular dynamics where we show only the sheet, the graphene sheet, 
and the DNA, and we have removed all the water molecule and the ion, okay? That's actually the potential generated. Okay, you can see that uh, here, this is a center of mass of the DNA. There was actually a slowdown of the center of mass here. And here we plot the van der Waals energies and the attraction energy between um, the between, between uh, the DNA and the graphene, and you can see that the dip corresponds really when the nick is actually sitting in the, uh, uh, in the nanopore. Okay, and uh, so comparison between the ionic current, that means is the nick, the breakage, able to block the current more efficiently than the DNA itself? Actually, it doesn't, okay? where, in fact, electronically, we can actually recognize it with a long, long, dip, uh, long dip here in uh, the electronic camera. Okay? We can actually do this. I'm sorry. Um, this is actually for the nick between the two different kind of bases. This is actually a nick between T and T base, a, a nick between C and C base, a nick between A and A bases. Okay, and each of them actually show, in fact, the detection by electronically but not ionically. Okay, uh, now the last figure, okay, is, uh, yeah, and uh, nanoelectronics which in terms of modeling and computer simulation require the integration of molecular dynamics and uh, you know, uh, semiconductor device modeling, in addition to statistical signal processing for recognition of a different body attached to the DNA. Okay? Application in epigenetics, as I mentioned. Okay? Application in damage identification along the DNA for biomolecules, but also for the storage of big data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.